Okay. So let me just uh, tee this up. Um, so this is the Board of Directors September meeting on September 16th, 2020 uh, at 8.30 a.m. And this meeting is being recorded and uh, videoed. It's all yours. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> uh, okay, let's do roll call. Suzanne Spellin. Suzanne is there. Okay, Sharon Nichols. Here. Here. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. Here. Patricia Riley. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Jeanette Nicholson. Here. Andrew Cooper. Here. Brian Barker. Here. Christina Maribel. Okay. Christina is absent. John Cubitt. Christina is on mute. Oh, she is? Okay. Yeah. I'm here. Good morning. I'm sorry. Okay. That's I'm okay. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Right. John Cubitt. John emailed and said he wouldn't be able to make the meeting for a unknown emergency or unforeseen emergency. And same okay. with John Carmelo. John Carmelo. All right. Is Kate Hedgeman in as well? Yes. Good morning. And Greg Tobin, are you here as well? All right. We have Tony Tazi. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I'd like to welcome everybody. Did everybody have an opportunity to go over last month's minutes, meeting minutes? Yes. Yeah. All right. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion. Brian Barker. I second that. Do we have Christina a second? Marble. Second. Okay. Uh, Suzanne Spellin? Or should I just, you want me to just do all in favor? Aye. <laughs> Aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> all right, Sharon, um, you're teed up for the financials. It's all you. Okay. So you guys have financial statements here. If you look at the balance sheet, you can see that we're in a much better cash situation than we were a month ago. Um, our bank balances at the end of August are about $185,000. So much better than our situation last month. So we're happy about that. Um, if you look year to year, it, we've got less cash than last year, um, but we got a little, little bit more properties than last year when you look at our property inventory. Um, we had a discussion yesterday about the OAG funds, um, enterprise funds, so they still owe us about $134,000 from round four. Um, so we've, we talked about that a little bit. Um, we've got, we've got um, Pioneer Bank Loan. Um, that's our line of credit that we've got out there, guys. Um, about $90,000. And Tony, were you able to determine what is our total line? I didn't get a chance to look, Sharon. Okay, <clears throat> I didn't get a chance to look either. Pardon me. Okay, so we have $89,000 out on our line. Um, we also have about $17,000 out on the, um, uh, for PPP loans. Hopefully they will get um, forgiven. Uh, that's the game plan. Tony is waiting for Pioneer Bank to give him the go ahead to put the paperwork through. <laughs> so hopefully that will be forgiven. Um, let's see, we, if you look year to date on the profit and loss, we are showing a profit of about $71,000. And I feel like a broken record when I say this, but if you compare year to year, the big difference between last year and this year were the private donations. We received the Stewart's house and we also received the Aquin house. Um, 
So that's, that's a big difference between last year and this year when you look at net income from year to year. Um, those are pretty much the highlights of the financials, guys. Does anybody have any questions about those? I'm, I'm good with everything. Thanks, Sharon. Does anybody uh, else? You're welcome. I know it's super exciting stuff, guys. <laughs> I think I understand it all. Okay. Um, the, let's see, the other thing we talked about, a couple things we talked about yesterday. Um, we have to have a budget up on the ABO website. Um, so we need to have something published by November 1st. So we went over preliminary budget yesterday. You guys don't have it yet because it is pretty preliminary. Um, the, there's a couple issues with the budget that we discussed. One is that we run out of um, grant funding after second quarter 2021. So we discussed about the fact that we really need to find some other sources of financing or uh, support. Um, and Tony was going to tap seat. And I think we're also going to um, maybe have some kind of powwow to get all of our great minds together to figure out what we could do in terms of additional funding sources for the land bank. Um, so that's, that's, obviously a serious concern, you know, that we don't at this point see additional attorney general or enterprise funds coming through, especially with COVID, state of New York finances, Tony has his doubts about whether we will be seeing um, any additional funding come through the state. So we really need to look for some alternative sources of funding. Um, so that was one thing. Another thing is it looks like we could be running into another cash flow crunch um, if jobs were to get done timely. Although that's questionable, we haven't had a lot of jobs get done timely. So I'm not really in a panic about that, but we could be up against it with a cash flow crunch if everything was to get done timely. Um, and that was kind of looking at where our cash would be at the end of December. Um, but like I said, with, <laughs> with the pace that we seem to be moving, with that everything seems to be moving, with COVID-related issues, obtaining materials, supply issues, um, supply chain issues, um, I'm not really sure that we really will run into an issue. So I don't want to panic about that. Um, again, we're still working our way through the budget. We will have something available for you guys to review and approve for our next board meeting. So we did work on that. Um, we did talk about potentially changing our fiscal year to see if that helps to move it from a calendar to a fiscal year. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, I don't know if anybody has any opinions about that or if anybody wants to discuss that at all, but we're basically trying to ease up Tony's crazy time in March. Um, so we looked at that as a possible option. We're still considering that. Um, let's see. Uh, you know, Tony, you know what I didn't bring up yesterday? Uh, where are we with the 990 filing? Have they gotten back to you at all with either this year's filing or with um, our status, whether we're going to need to be filing either now or going forward? Do you have any further information from them? Um, I haven't heard from uh, Alan Walters from uh, Bonadeo in uh, probably about a month. And, and to be honest, I, I meant to check in with him before yesterday's finance meeting and I just didn't get to it. Um, the last uh, last time I heard from him, he was just asking me for, um, I believe some, uh, you know, some board information that needed to be, he needed to, uh, to, to have as part of the filing. Um, I know when we first started talking about it, he was essentially saying everything at IRS like the rest of the world, is running much slower than it had been before. Um, so he wanted to get off 
uh, you know, get that started as soon as you possibly could. And it, uh, it didn't get started quite as, as soon as we were projecting. So he, he started off probably about a month behind. Um, so I, I, I do need to check in with him and, and ask where he's at with it. And, um, you know, maybe RS is starting to work a little faster. Maybe they're not, but I, I would need, I'd like to know that too. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't count on that, Tony. They, uh, <laughs> well, you're in a good position to know. Yeah. My understanding is that they came back to work and everybody came back to literally piles of mail and whatnot on their desks. So I wouldn't count on the IRS moving anything through too quickly anytime soon. So I think what we're going to need to inquire about is what is the status of our Form 990? Because I do believe we will need to file one for our last fiscal year. And uh, the outside date on filing that is going to be November 15th. So we're going to need to get something in our hands and get it ready for board approval so that we can get that file timely. Okay. Hey, Sharon. Yeah. It's Kate. Hi, Kate. I had a chance to look at the fiscal year issue in relation to uh, the ABO reporting and the okay. annual report. And it is um, required within 90 days of your fiscal year. So it's tied to, um, you know, your audit process. Yeah, okay, thank you for looking. That doesn't surprise me. So what that means, Tony, is that the ABO reporting, <laughs> um, the tax reporting, everything is, well, the tax reporting, of course, we can always get an extension, but the ABO reporting, which is the most chaotic part, is tied to the year end. So regardless of where we have the year end, it's still going to create chaos. I don't know if that would help at all. Um, I'm not sure. So we can discuss that a little bit further. But it doesn't help, I don't think, as much as you were hoping, I guess, is the answer. Yeah, let me um, make a laundry list of everything that needs to happen in March, and um, I'll have a better sense. Okay. And I guess my, you know, one of my questions, Tony, is if, our, if we change our fiscal year, are we still doing an annual report in March? I mean, does that even make sense at that point? You know what I'm saying? I, I don't know if, if. Well, you would, if your if end of your fiscal year is June 30th, that report would be due July, August, sometime in September. So, um, you know, that, that's, but the audit would also take place, you know, that summer or whatever, right? Um, and because you're going to, gonna, yeah, you're going to need the audited uh, financials. Uh -huh. The county was on a, a July 1st to June 30th for quite a while, and they changed it over to a calendar year. Hmm. Um, so oh. I guess it really just, um, in terms of enterprise reporting, right, um, that's due quarterly. So I don't know, right, Tony? Like, I don't know yeah. if having something due the end of September is any better. It sounds um, like the, you know, more or less the entire, um, all the tasks that would have to be done, we're just moving the window from, you know, one quarter to another. I think right. that's, yeah, I think that's true. So right. March Madness would turn into uh, what, September Madness? Right. Yeah. So, or thereabouts. So, okay, thank you, Kate. Thanks for checking on that. Yeah, sure. thank you, Kate. Okay. So, um, Tony, can you please follow up with um, the accounting firm yep. um, regarding our status, if there's any new information, and also um, our 990, because I do believe we're going to need to get the 990 uh, probably filed for this year, at least. And so that's going to be due by November 15th as the outside date. And I don't know if we're going to have a November meeting in time for approval. So we may need to have that approved in October. Yeah, if our normal um, November board meeting would be November 18th. So mm. we could pull it up a week if we really had to, but it'd be nicer if we got it done in October. Yeah. Had it done in October. Uh, does that pretty much sum everything up? 
Tony, did I, and Kate, did I miss anything from yesterday? I'm trying to do the quick version. I think that's it. I mean, in the context of um, a discussion about future strategic planning, finance is definitely a piece of that, but I think you got everything. Okay. Okay, so that's it for me, unless anyone has questions. Uh, I'm all set. So we'll move on to committee reports. The executive committee met to go over the, the agenda that we have in front of us today. The A&D committee met and there are, is a resolution for the sale of multiple properties that is on the agenda today that um, we met about. So I'm going to go ahead. Brian, do you want Tony to to go over these or did you want to, how did you want to uh, preface the uh, resolution? I can let Tony do it. I mean, Tony okay. has it all in front of him. I, I don't have it. All right. right so Tony, I'm going to have you present the resolution for the, we have in front of us the sale of multiple properties, 103 Ferry Street and 899 River Street. So uh, 103 Ferry Street, um, Stephanie Payne's <clears throat> submitted an application. Um, she offered, um, uh, 56 something, I believe, um, A and D passed a resolution to recommend the sale of the property to Stephanie Payne's at a purchase price of $72,500. Um, Tara Small, um, submitted a purchase application for 899 River Street. Um, that application was, I believe, $10,000. And, um, there was an issue. Um, Tara um, initially was not planning on, she was planning on keeping the property as a rental investment. And I explained to her that's not something that uh, A and D wanted to see there. And she revised her application um, and, and said that she would flip the property, um, but it wasn't clear that she would flip it to an owner occupant. A and D in their recommendation um, required that she amend the application to clarify that it would be flipped to an owner occupant approved by the board before, you know, before the sale, of course. So um, I had to scramble yesterday to get amended applications from them. Um, and I do have those. So, so all the, both applications, Stephanie Payne's and Tara Small um, have been amended to reflect A and D's recommendation to the board. Took a little doing. Uh, Stephanie Payne initially was not uh, feeling comfortable with A and D's recommendation. She wanted uh, she wanted certain things, and um, when I talked to her on the way home yesterday, I said, you know, the the chair has asked that we pull this from the agenda, and she immediately said, I'll just submit an application uh, to reflect what A and D recommended which she did. And um, that's, that's where we're at. So we have two applications that reflect precisely what A and D's recommendation uh, specifies. And what was that recommendation again, Tony? I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page. That uh, for happened. Stephanie Payne's, it was that the purchase price be 72,500. For Tara Small, it was to uh, amend the application to clarify that the property would be flipped to an owner occupant who would be approved by the board before that sale takes place. In our sole discretion, yes. Um, well, those words are not on the application, but your resolution or your purchase agreement will no doubt say that, right? Yes. Um, so that's where we are with those two applications. Did you want me to go through the rest of A and D's meeting, or do you want to stop there and uh, take action on those two applications? Well, I'm going to put it on the table for discussion. Does anybody does anybody have any questions about the process and about the two purchase applications? I I think I, I inadvertently cut somebody off. So whoever was going to talk <laughs> was that you, Brian? I I was ready to make a, a motion on those, but. If there's more discussion, right. I just I have, well, one, Andrew, I have one 
I think, simple question. The $10,000 figure, is, is that that's consistent with what we expected for that property? Um, I believe it was listed for 12. Let me... Um, I mean, that's... Listed for 12, I would say that's five, consistent. I believe. <laughs> that's close yeah. enough. Let me just take a look at... <laughs> Let me take a look at the application real quick. Yes, yeah, so I was listed for twelve thousand five hundred, and the offer was ten thousand dollars, which A and D accepted. Thanks. That was my only question about anything. Okay. Okay. Brian made a motion. Do I have a second? This is Andrew. I'll second. Okay. Um, Heather King, I vote aye. Suzanne Spellin, you vote aye. aye. Sharon Nichols. Aye. Brian Boker, Barker made the motion. Andrew Cooper seconded it. Uh, Jeanette Nicholson. Aye. John Cubitt and John Carmelo are absent. Christina Maribel. Christina is on mute. I said aye. I'm sorry. I'm, okay. I got aye. mute on a number of different things. <laughs> Patricia Riley. Aye. Okay. Everybody's in favor. We're going to move on to Tony. Um, I'm going to turn the table over to you because there's numerous items. These are all we've made all of our uh, everything that needed motions for this month. But now you have the donation of property Mount Olympus. There is the draft agreement for Beacon for discussion, a draft MOU between RPI, TAP, Habitat, and Detroit Community Land Bank the um, COVID-19 grant application update and a property update. So Tony, there you go. Okay, so. Um, I've had not had the chance yet to review that MOU. I didn't realize it was gonna be on the agenda, just FYI. Yeah, no, that's understandable, Kate. That's why I, uh, when I emailed one of my several emails to the board yesterday, I, I, I tried to point out that this was a first draft and it's definitely going to require um, some amendments. Um, okay. So uh, let me start off with the donation of property of Mount Olympus. Um, I was asked to check in with the city to see if they had any environmental records. Um, I talked to Steve Strykman and he said, indeed, they have nothing. <laughs> um, and in fact, we have, we have a lot more environmental information in that area of the city than the city has. Um, so he was happy to hear that we have a 2006, pay, 2006 long page um, phase one ESA that the city has asked if we could give to them. Um, that was started by Monica, so I, I told him I'd give them to that. But the bottom line for Mount Olympus is that um, I could not get any additional information from the city. I shared that with A&D, and A&D recommended that um, that the land bank not take possession of the property, not accept, not accept the donation. So does anybody want to discuss that? Is there a concern about too much risk there for the land bank, Tony? The con uh, well, the initial concern was uh, potential environmental contamination and, you know, liability the land bank might take on um, we had asked the current owner if they would pay for a phase one ESA <clears throat> for the parcel and they were not willing to do that. They said they would rather just not pay the taxes and, and have it end up in the hands of the city. Um, so in the conversation after that, that's when I was asked to go check in with the city to see if they had anything that would provide more clarification but they, they didn't, so um, A&D, you know, passed their recommendation to not accept the parcel. It's a parcel that has no proposed practical use. There's no. It's a, it's a shale potential. outcropping. Um, it's, and it's not, it's, it's not quite, it's, I'm sorry, it's a little more or a little less than half of Mount Olympus. The northern section is owned by another party. Um, so uh, one interesting thing I, I learned in checking in this, Mount, Olympics, Mount Olympus was a much larger 
um, mound or mountain, I guess. Um, it, it went all the way over to River Street and it was quite large, which Suzanne had mentioned before. So, um, but what you've got there is something that I doubt has ever been developed on. Um, it's much higher in elevation than anything around it. The 2006 page uh, ESA that Chazen developed back in 2000, uh, back in 2015, I did go through and take a look at it to see if I could identify anything. And I could not find anything on that property. There were some, you know, some random spills here and there in that general vicinity, but nothing that I could find on the property itself. So Brian, you don't see A and D doesn't see this being developed into anything that the land bank can turn around. Um, and it, it, it's, you don't be, you don't see it as an asset basically to the land bank in, in a potential liability. Is that what I'm hearing? That's correct. And I concur. As did I. Okie doke, thanks. So I, I guess that there's either more discussion on that or if the board wants to take action in contrast to a and D's recommendation, um, if, if none of those are needed, then I'll move on to the next item. Okay, so next item on the agenda is the draft agreement um, uh, from Beacon Communities. That's something that uh, we got, I think last week, Kate, right? And Kate has gone through it and she's found a few issues. Um, so she's working with Beacon's attorney to try to get that tweaked a little bit. Um, she didn't find anything, you know, uh, way, way off, just uh, some, uh, a couple of things here and there. Um, so that's still, you know, a, a work in progress. And um, it will likely, hopefully, be ready for board action at the October meeting. Does that sound right, Kate? Tony, is the, yep. is the proposed uh, purchase price still in the 75,000 range or? Um, it should be. I, off the top of my head, Brian, I, I don't know the exact contents of the agreement, um, but that's, that should be still the uh, sales amount. I don't see any reason why it would not be. So any discussion or questions on that? It's hard to have any questions with nothing to review. <laughs> um, well, I, I thought I circulated the, the draft agreement, but again, it's, it's just a draft. So, um, but so this is really just an update. It's not really, there's, you're right, Jeanette, there's not a lot to talk about. I just want to let everyone know where it stood. Yeah, because I've got to look at it and then ultimately it'll come back to the board for final approval. Yeah. Yeah, it'd just be good to have a peek at it before <laughs> the board meeting. I thought I circulated that. If not, I, I'll, I can do that. Well, I mean the one that's going to be amended, you know, the final. Oh, the, the final rendition, yeah. You're yeah. Gonna, you're definitely going to need to see that. Okay. So I'll jump into the uh, RPI TAP Habitat TCLB um, draft memorandum of understanding. Uh, this is similar to the beacon in, in terms of where it is in process. That was just circulated, uh, I think, Monday uh, afternoon. Uh, it, it's going to no doubt uh, require some changes. I went through it and I had a bunch of comments, you know, not, nothing really um, egregious but just uh, suggested tweaks here and there. Um, Kate still needs to look at it. Um, so uh, I believe we were asked to provide comments by uh, the 25th of this month. Uh, and, uh, you know, we'll get, hopefully we'll be able to get those over to uh, RPI and um, the other parties will as well. And there'll be a second rendition. And when there's a final rendition, it'll get circulated to the board and uh, the board will take whatever action it would like. 
Um, Tony, my, my main comment on the, the draft uh, MOU was um, just that somehow each party outlines their contribution to the to the partnership. So I guess the land, the land bank would have to come up with some language about how our contribution is more in the realm of site control. You know, um, I, I think the way they the way it's written right now, as far as the roles, it's it's more of the general purpose and then RPI's role. I think if, if, if the other parties kind of follow up with their role, their basic general role in the partnership, that, that would probably be enough for me. Yeah, I, I agree. It was uh, more a conceptual uh, piece than it was a detailed piece. So that makes sense, Brian. Yeah. Just making that note. Okay. Sorry, I just jotted that, that note down. So any more discussion on that agenda item? Okay, hearing none. The CDBG COVID-19 grant application I submitted to the city, um, I checked in with Carolyn uh, from City Hall and she said that email should be going out Friday of this week from the mayor's office to let all applicants know how things turned out. So um, nothing really to report of substance, but I'll, I should have something on Friday. And Tony, um, if I remember correctly, that was a little over $36,000 that you applied for? Yeah, it was in that, it was in that range, yes. And just so everyone knows, this is a grant um, it, not to be repaid. And Tony had outlined several categories how he intended to use the money. So hopefully everything gets approved. Hopefully they like his uses of the money and hopefully we get that approved because that would be additional grant money for us. That would be helpful. Yeah, this is a little similar to the PPP grant. So it's it's not a competitive grant. It's, it's a, essentially it's as long as what you're going to use the money for meets HUD's requirement, then um, then the city doesn't have to pay it back. Um, the city has told me that they have not received a ton of applications, and that there was uh, there was more money than they had applications for. So the fact that it's not a competitive grant, um, you know, it seems to me like this should be a fairly easy decision for the city. I know their biggest concern is that they have their T's crossed, I's dotted, so that um, HUD doesn't ask for any money back down the road that the city would have to pay back. So I think that's their biggest concern. But we'll know Friday. Hopefully. Tony, if I remember correctly, this came through Richard Herrick too, correct? He was the one that first uh, let me know that this, this was available. So yeah, kudos to, to Richard for that. Okay, so uh, I'm just kind of thinking and, and partly joking and partly serious. Um, if he is a good person <laughs> to help us maybe nose out some other grant opportunities that we're not aware of, um, I don't know if there's, uh, if, if, if that could be maybe helpful. I don't know if he's that kind of person that can help with future grants. Um, well, here's what I would say. I don't think Richard would hesitate in a moment to send the land bank an email <laughs> um, to help or to correct things here. Um, but I can certainly, I, mean, I can certainly, um, first of all, thank him, which I've already done, but I can thank him again and ask if he could keep his eyes open for anything else. And that, that kind of runs along the lines of uh, my conversations with seat and having seat help us uh, you know do some grant research and once we find some grants we are eligible for that makes sense um, for them to further help us get those grants written um, and, and so that's this is a little aside from this one particular agenda item but that will 
require uh, the land bank and seat to get together to do some strategic planning so that we all know what kind of grants we ought to be looking for. So um, seat has just started their new, their uh, uh, school year with their youth bill program. So last week and this week, they've been kind of crazy because they're just starting off. So um, I haven't, I've tried to connect with seat to talk to them a little bit more before these, the finance meeting and today's board meeting, but um, they've just been too busy to get back to me, so. Any more uh, questions, discussion on the COVID-19 grant? This is Andrew. Is there a, uh, presuming that we receive the grant or some of the grant, is there a timeline for um, completing purchases and spending the money? I'm just curious because the the stuff that uh, you presented as, as what we would spend it on is likely what everyone wants to be purchasing and spending money on. And there's so many things now that are hard, hard to get. Uh, I just was wondering. Uh, um. Off, how the that top, looks. off the top of my head, I, I don't know that there's a um, a deadline. There probably is. I just don't know what it is off the top of my head. Um, but I hear what you're saying. You know, one part of the grant is to purchase, I think, a dozen tablets, um, which goes back to Suzanne's recommendation way back in February, I think. Um, that might be something that's back ordered. <laughs> Yeah, so, exactly. Um, <laughs> and plexiglass and I mean, yeah. and HVAC purification systems and all, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah, I know. Um, so that's a good question, Andrew. Um, let me see what happens on Friday. And once once I know, then I'll uh, call Carolyn back and ask her what the timelines are, if, if there are any, which I'm sure there are. Um, I mean, it was, I'm just curious. I, I, I realize there's nothing to actually, it doesn't change anything, whatever the answer is, but. Well, but it, I think it's an important question because if we can't get tablets for three years and the grant says you have to spend the money in 12 months, then um, that's not going to work very well. Sure. I'm just jotting that note down. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a good question. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. I'll, uh, I'll also try to jump into the application to see if I can identify that myself, uh, whether there's a timeline. And if I find that there is, I'll circulate that info to the board. Uh, anything else on COVID-19? Okay. So uh, let's see, properties update report. <clears throat> uh, let me start with 791 River Street. Um, So I had my check-in call with Enterprise Community uh, two Thursdays ago, and I gave them the status update on um, 791. They were concerned, and um, they were going, well, uh, my, uh, Tanya was going to check with uh, her supervisor, Elizabeth Belden, and that never, is a good thing. <laughs> so um, I talked to Kate and um, Kate suggested that we get our heads very square on what the contract requires and that we um, get an update on the status of the project. Last Friday, I went through the building with Beth Steckley. We came up with a laundry list, pretty good laundry list of issues, um, a lot of workmanship issues. Friday, I'm meeting with Beth <clears throat> and the uh, architect on site, and uh, we're going to go through the laundry list, and uh, we're going to ask him to provide answers and uh, to provide backup to his answers. So, for example, he has said that um, the metal panels that are to be installed on the exterior of the building are on back order. Um, you know, with, with everything that's going on with COVID-19, I, I have a strong tendency to believe him. But if it's on back order, then what I'll be asking for is, okay, show me that you've ordered it. So we know that it's actually on back order. 
Um, same thing with a, a few other, I think the storefront materials may be back ordered. ordered. Um, then there's uh, issues regarding workmanship um, in a lot of places. And Beth found some uh, specifications that she's not sure if they were followed through. Uh, they may be, she's just not sure. So th those are kind of the areas of questions we have for the architect that we'll, we'll need him to uh, answer. Uh, we'll also be asking him for a new projected uh, progress report, or pr uh, progress schedule, I should say. Um, one problem that it looked like we were really gonna run into, fortunately, um, Tenek, uh, our insurance broker, helped us. We have builder's risk insurance and uh, the carrier for that said, we will give you one last extension for builder's risk insurance. I asked the architect for a very, very conservative date and he said September 15th. So that's what I submitted. Um, and. So our builder's risk was going to be terminated yesterday. Uh, Ten Eyck contacted the, the insurance carrier and they're willing to extend it to December 15th. So that's really good news. Um, and hopefully this project will get done before, before that uh, date comes and goes. So I'll Tony, what is our agreement? I'm just curious what our agreement with TAP is um, in terms of keeping tabs on progress. Are there like biweekly job progress meetings or any ongoing meetings with the contractor and the architect? Before COVID, things? Uh, Brian, before yeah, COVID, we were, uh, Beth Seckley uh, was doing weekly inspections, weekly reports, um, and she was doing a really, really good job at keeping um, a detailed record of everything. Uh, then COVID hit and, you know, and then 791, everything slowed down. 791, of course, was there was still progress, but it wasn't fast progress. In light of what's going on with the lack of progress right now, I, I asked Beth to come back in and get, kind of get back to doing her weekly reports the way she was doing them before. So. Um, so that's where we're at with it at present. Um, does that make sense to you? Do you have any other recommendations on how we ought to proceed? Um, well, I, I think you would be allowed to have, you know, a, a distance to meeting on site. I mean, so it seems like those should just continue me because it would give you an opportunity to regularly check in on progress, you know, and look each other in the eye. Yeah, that's, I think that's the plan from here on out. So okay. really what's happening right now is we're, we're getting back to that. Um, and it'll be, we'll, so we'll be meeting on a weekly or a bi-weekly basis from this point forward. Yeah, I mean, I would say that if they can actually work, they'll get it done, you know, in the next probably two months if they just work. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I think the problem, you know, I don't want to defend the GC or the architect, but it, the supply chain for everything in the world seems to be breaking down. I know Fiden yeah. was on TV and said, you know, it used to take two weeks to get uh, appliances delivered. And now it's taking, um, I don't know if they said eight, 10 weeks or more. Um, and I think that's just what's going on in the world. You get one break in the supply chain and, and everything stops. Um, people are working with masks on and further distance from each other. So efficiency in the workforce is less than it used to be. So I, I do believe that there are factors at play that directly impact the slow progress at 791 River Street. That's my belief, but um, I need to document that um, not only for our purposes, but also to show enterprise, you know, we're doing our due diligence and to show them the reasons why the status is what it is. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. 
Tony? Yeah. Suzanne? Well, on the interior, um, I could see through the window that they got the walls up. Um, what what else is going on in the inside? Uh, the inside, the sheetrock is all hung and painted. Um, the ceilings also. Uh, the, uh, the cabinets are in boxes stored there. So, you know, one question I have is why, why isn't that work being done? Um, they're, they need to put down a second subfloor to meet their specs. That's not been done yet. Um, so it really for the interior, it comes down to finishes at this point, cabinets, um, you know, bathroom fixtures, lighting fixtures, um, floor covering, molding, um, the HVAC system has to be installed. Uh, and then the, you know, what you see on the exterior that's not finished, that needs to be completed. And that's generally the bulk of what needs to be completed. Um, the workmanship issues are other, that, that's a separate set of uh, issues that we have. And one example is on the back, on the back wall in the gangway of the building, <clears throat> when they laid up the masonry, you know, usually when you're laying up block, some water just slops onto the work you did below. And what any mason does is they take the trowel and they knock off the mortar and it keeps it clean. Looking at the back wall, no one did any of that. So now somebody has to go back and grind down oh, all that slop instead of what would have taken two seconds to do as they were, you know, working up the, uh, uh, the scaffolding basically. So that's just an example of workmanship um, that we need to talk to the architect about. There's a laundry list, but that's just one example. Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Suzanne. No, I was just saying okay. <laughs> oh, so Tony, do you have some sense of where we are in terms of completion? That December 15th date makes me a little bit nervous. Um, that gives us three months to wrap up this project and with a contractor that's been dragging, dragging, dragging his heels. Well, I think that's why we need to find out factually why progress has slowed down. You know, if he tells me he has, um, say, the metal panels on the exterior on back order, and I say to him, well, okay, show me that you've submitted the order, and he can't show me that, then there's going to be an issue. Um, if he shows me he's ordered a lot of material, and indeed it is back ordered, then, then that's the answer. He simply can't get the materials quickly enough. Um, you know, one thing that kind of bothered me when I was in there, the uh, horizontal siding <clears throat> is probably 80%, 90% done. There's siding sitting in the uh, ground floor that's been painted just waiting to go up and it's not, it's not going up. So why isn't somebody finishing that? That's one of my questions. That will be one of my questions. Um, you know, why isn't this, the second subfloor being put down on the uh, second and third floors? Um, that's, that's not difficult to do. <clears throat> um, although, having said that, I don't know how difficult it is to get plywood. I hear it's, it's tripled in price and it's hard to get. So, um, so the, I, there are, there's a long laundry list of questions and I really won't have a good sense until we go through those questions with him. He provides answers. And to the extent he can, he provides supporting backup to those answers. So Tony, the other thing I would ask you to hold him accountable for is weather related things. So if there's anything on the exterior that needs to be done in good weather, we need that done, if at all physically possible, right? I was I mean, thinking that about the siding, like if it's yeah. not finished, it's not watertight and you're gonna risk damage to what is there. Because no, no, not, and, not that's, and, and that's what I'm saying. The siding is sitting on the ground floor painted, ready to be uh, installed, and it's not. Um, and it's been there for probably a month. So, you know, one of my questions is going to be, hey, why is this sitting here for a month? Why don't you, have, why don't you get that section of exterior 
completed, you know, why, what's the reason? So maybe he has a good reason. Um, from what I'm looking at right now, I, I don't think he will. I yeah, just, and, and then if there's any other masonry or if there's painting or anything that's sensitive to the weather, um, that needs to really be prioritized because God knows we don't want to hear that they can't do something um, because of the weather at this point in time. And then yeah. we can't make our timeline by December 15th. I mean, this is just kind of crazy. Yeah, well, the weather was one of the delaying factors before. Um, so we don't want it to be a factor, you know, this time if we can help it. <clears throat> that kind of speaks to the workmanship issues. You know, a lot of it is on the exterior. So it's better to do it now before than before the snow flies or it gets really, really cold. I mean, I, they, they can do the work in the cold, but it's going to be slower. So, but I hear, I hear what you're saying on that. I've got the same worry, thought, etc. You know, it took less time to build the Empire State Building than to build this building. <laughs> yeah, but it stayed empty for 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> but it was done. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <clears throat> uh I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole, but I also wonder if in regard to supply chain issues, if especially for finishes, uh, if, if there are any um, or reportedly are, if it's worth considering alternatives. I mean, that's what everybody is doing. You go to the grocery store, you're like, oh, they don't have my, my bread that I like, so I have to get another kind of bread. Uh, <clears throat> if it's a three month delay on, you know, which essentially means who knows if you'll ever get it because you know, that, again, I'm making up stuff here, but um, then we should look uh, for alternatives, um, you know, equivalent, but get, tell the architect, hey, we need, you know, give us, give us some other finish, give us another, you know, with the metal, with whatever the metal siding stuff is. Well, it, you know, if I'm the builder, I might think, well, that's my guy, that's the company I work with, I know how that works, that's easy, and they tell me it's three months, so, oh, well. Well, maybe not. Maybe you need to. Maybe we need to have them do legwork and find another supplier, or at least try. I'm sure everybody's doing that. But if they're not doing it, I feel like that's the same category of question as to well, why isn't the siding up? You could be doing that. Um, yeah. Again, it, it comes down to the details that I'm not. You know, I don't know about. But uh, well, I think that's think about it. And that's part of this exercise and in, in meeting with the uh, the architect on Friday. Um, you know, we need to get a pretty clear handle on what the status of <clears throat> the overall project is. And once we, <clears throat> pardon me guys, there goes my voice again. <clears throat> once we do have a better picture, then um, Kate's gonna be involved and she's, um, she's going to be um, sending a letter to the contractor and look, she'll be using whatever leverage we have in the contract to get things to move forward. But yeah, Andrew, I I totally agree with what you're saying. We, we need to know, <clears throat> we need to have a clearer picture of what the status is and what the progress projection is <clears throat> before we take the next step. So. You guys wanna talk about 791 anymore? It'll be a happy day when that ribbon gets cut. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might, we might, I will we might say that it's, it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, then I'll. I uh, will go. say that it is, um, it is pretty prevalent right now, the delays and all the construction materials. So it, it's, it's a hot mess. Yeah. Yeah, you know, just walk into Home Depot or Lowe's in their lumber section and take a look. It's scary. <laughs> What's well, going? Uh, what's going on what, with all the ones that are Kate's got a is um, trying to get back? I. All right, hold on one second. I just wanted to comment on 791. Um, I think once we have a better grasp about what's going on, and um, you know, I, I all the information I have so far is sort of this. Here's, here's bits and pieces of what they're saying. I think we might have to call a meeting so I can nail that down. But um, the reality is, even if 
they have supply issues, you know, I want to try to nail them down to, um, okay, but within, you know, 30 to 60 days, whatever that turns out to be, of receiving these materials, it needs to be done. Um, the problem is, you know, getting them to sign off on something like that. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll do the best that they, we can with it. Um, they're, not, they're not the greatest contractors in the world, and that's what I'll leave it at. And, and Tony, and I imagine this is on your discussion um, points, but they need to understand we have a drop dead date of December 15th, because after that, we don't have insurance. So that is a drop dead date. They need to figure out how they're gonna make it happen. Um, like Andrew said, whether they substitute materials or whatever needs to happen, like we need this thing done. Yeah. Um, well, after December 15th, we, we still would have insurance. It'll just be more expensive. Um, instead, instead of builder's risk, we'll have hazard and liability <clears throat> and the price will at least double, probably triple. So, but yeah, if, if he can get this done by December 15th, then he's only a year and a half behind schedule. That would be great. <laughs> Kate, was there more you were going to say? Because I thought your thing was a two part. Well, Heather had asked about the update of the enforcement, and I'm still waiting for title on those properties before I take them back. So we're still, you know, I have to look at the title first, and then I'll have a better idea of when I'm going to bring the actions and where we're going to go from there. Okay. I think the owner of um, the one across the street from me, what was that, 822? Yeah. Uh, she applied to either the ZBA or, or planning, I can't remember which, for um, a variation, I mean, a, not a variation. Um, Variance? Yeah, thank you. For parking. And that was recently, like within the last month or so. Yes, she strangely has had no conversation with us at all. Am I correct in that, Tony and Kate? She's not yes. responded to any letters or any, there's been absolute, there's been zero communication. Yep, yeah, that's, that's correct. That is, yep. So this, it's, there needs to be a communication and a meeting and if she, she needs to apply for an extension. Um, so I don't know, right now it's in the process of being foreclosed upon. Am I correct, Kate? Even though you're waiting for, I mean, yeah, we've made a motion. We've made a motion to take it back. Correct. So that's keep keep that in mind at the you know at the planning board meeting. I don't know how that impacts that. No, actually, I think it was zoning, not yeah. Not planning. Yeah, the, I, I don't know how it. that I impacts saw it on that, but somewhere. <laughs> okay. All right, what I might do in light of that is put a letter out there with a copy of the board resolution to foreclose and a cease and desist, and then maybe she'll call or something. Because, I mean, we're certainly, we're certainly open to granting an extension. I mean, am I correct in speaking on behalf of the board? We've had that certain, you know, certain situations in the past. I mean, the Sean Sheffer, you know, our first sale, he had he ran into some difficulties, you know, like as far he did a lot of the work himself and he ran into some difficulties and we granted extensions, but there has been zero communication here. So not even a conversation entertaining an extension and the fact that she's in violation. That, right. That's the frustrating part. Yeah, right. So, so once okay. I have title, I will, <clears throat> um, you know, circle back around. But, you know, I think at this point, we got to move forward with taking it back and let her respond. That makes sense. All right, maybe we can find out what address, I mean, do we have the appropriate address for her? She lives on Coal Lane. Is she not, is she not, that was at the time of, I mean, is that current? 
Is she I'm not getting the communication? That I don't know. Um, I mean, maybe we can find out from the city what her contact information is. I, I'm trying to give everybody the benefit of the doubt here. Well, I can tell you my letters did not come back returned and the return address was on there. Yeah, okay. Um. All right. I will, I will right. fire, I will fire another warning shot before I file the action. I'm just waiting for title and then I'll have a better, um, you know, report on what we're going to do next. Okay. Um, and Tony, maybe we should reach out to zoning and see what the address is, the contact information on that. We have to foil it and just make sure that we are, we have the correct communication channels for her. I'm, well, I'm looking at the assessment record and it shows 34 coal lane. <clears throat> right, but that's not necessarily what's what's updated. Yeah, no, I know, but I'm just saying that's what that's what's shown right now. I'll look to see if it All was right. on planning or, or zoning and I'll shoot an email out. Okay. All right. Appreciate that. I just want to make sure we have the we cover all bases. Okay. So, um, jump me jump into other property updates. I unfortunately I have to I have to hop on to something else. Is it okay if I excuse myself, Suzanne? Can you close the meeting? Are you okay with that? Yeah, but I'm gonna have to hop off pretty soon too. <clears throat> okay. All right. I'm may at I, work and, may I and call? it's getting busy. <laughs> May I adjourn the meeting and then if everybody would like to stay on, we don't have any anything else to make a motion on. Then if anybody else would like to stay on and chat with Tony about what else is going on, does that sound like a plan for everybody? I would just leave the meeting open. I'll close it. Okay. Because everything <gasps> has you, to be on, everything has to be on the record. So Okay. All right. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. See you, Heather. Bye. Bye. I'm sorry, I have to I have to go too. Mm -hmm. Sorry. It's okay. All right. Do we do we have a quorum left with the two of them gone? Uh, we I think we do. We're missing four then, right? Four, five, six. We should have exactly what we need for a quorum. One, okay. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, Okay. We have, no, we have yeah. one extra, so. <laughs> All right, just checking. Go ahead. Okay, so um, just update you on the properties that are in progress under construction. Um, 54 Fifth Avenue, that's the project seats doing for us. Um, they're back in there and starting to do work, or they should be by now. Um, as I mentioned, their youth build program, um, the school year essentially started uh, last week. So um, there was uh, additional remediation work needed in the cellar. Um, and this is work that um, Reeves Engineering kind of knew about, but at the time there was such a rush to get the RFP out so we could get responses back so, we so that we could show Enterprise we had a live project so we could apply for the round 4.2 grant um, that um, that the decision was made okay we'll, we'll have to address this after we get through the grant application process because we don't really have enough time to do it otherwise um, so then COVID hit and the world stopped <clears throat> And um, it's, it, it took me a little bit of time to get uh, Russ Reeves back into the building, but he, he finally did do the uh, drawings and specs that were needed, submitted them to um, the city. Permits have been issued, so seats got a total green light to go. Um, the downside on that is there, there was a, uh, essentially a change order of, uh, I think it was $15,000 or thereabouts for that additional work. Um, Finance Committee looked at it yesterday and uh, approved the, the increased cost. Um, 
even though it's an increased cost, the good news is that because of youth builds labor, the costs are a lot lower than they would be if this were a general contractor. And the other good news is that if 899 actually does get sold, it will free up $40,000 that I had budgeted to put into that building, which can be reallocated to 54 Fifth Ave and um, elsewhere if needed. Um, so the same situation, additional stabilization work being needed to be um, evaluated and spec'd out by Reeves Engineering is also needed for 3229 6th Avenue and 11 Winnie Avenue. Both, both of those are being uh, GC'd by Johnny Bobo. Um, Reeves, my last email from Reeves said that he would be there by the end of this week and have uh, everything into the city by the end of this week or, or early next week. Um, so Johnny Bobo has really done actually a really good job getting as much done as he can, um, but he's just kind of gotten as far along as he can and now needs this to get uh, get into the city and have the city, you know, give the green light. Um, so I also need to sit down with Seat and Johnny Bobo to take a, to, to get a better handle on how they're seeing the project progress going so that I have a better handle of how the cash flow will run through those projects so I can adjust the uh, what we have now for the draft 2021 annual budget. Um, so uh, so that's the uh, at 11 Winnie Avenue the new roof is on it the front and back porches have been demolished <clears throat> on the interior, all the sheet rocks, rocks has been taken down. Everything has been insulated. Um, the chimney's been taken down. Uh, some stabilization work was done, was done in the basement, stabilization work that was recognized as needed, um, you know, from the get-go. So at 3229, that building is not as stable as, uh, you know, the others. It's not as bad as 785 River Street, thankfully. Um, but Bobo has gone in and um, gutted the rest of the building. Uh, he's taken off a section of roof that was so deteriorated, he was worried that it was just going to collapse. Um, so he's really at a standstill there, and he needs Russ Reeves to get his work done so that can start moving forward again. And that's uh, that's everything we've got. So any questions on any of those? Tony, this is not a question, but I don't know if you saw Brian's needs to be uh, allowed back in the meeting again. I don't oh, know geez. If he kicked out or something. He just sent a, a, a chat. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Ryan. That's all right. I dropped out for some crazy reason. Um, so that's my status report on the properties. Any questions for anyone? Questions, comments? Okay. Well, shall, that, I, shall I make a motion to adjourn? I think you just did. All righty. I'll second. So those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, I'll note that the uh, meeting was adjourned at 940. Okay, thanks everybody. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Tony. See you, everybody. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. Bye, everyone. Oh, my God. That's a... Oh.